Doctor is muted. Okay. okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, sir. Okay, great. I, I'm glad to be here this morning. And uh, I would like to specially thank uh, the Institute for giving me this privilege of uh, meeting these wonderful uh, corporate executives. I have have the I've had the privilege of uh, reviewing um, a, a, the section of uh, the people, a cross section of the people who are the participants of this program, and I have seen that a good number of us are lawyers, we are corporate leaders, uh, uh, corporate executives. So I'm always so happy uh, to be granted audience before uh, participants of this nature because uh, what that means to me is that, uh, in as much as uh, I'm speaking. I'm also having the opportunity to also learn from uh, arrays of uh, corporate leaders. So thank you very much. So our topic that we are considering today is uh, this uh, framework of corporate governance and then um, compliance. So at the end of this session, uh, we expect participants to understand the framework of corporate governance we expect participants to identify the differences between organizational governance and management, and also understand board dynamics. And then finally, we, have, we expect participants to be able to appreciate the need for regulatory compliance and enforcement. So now the question is, can everybody see the screen? I'm sharing the screen. Yes, sir, we can see the screen, sir. Okay. Uh, it's a bit small on my end. I, I can see the registrar's page, but I, the document itself is very small. Okay, uh, just give me a few minutes to quickly make necessary adjustments. Thank you, sir. It appears the screen is not, is, I'm not able to control it from this end, any, end anymore. Can the IT help us, please? I'm not able to control it from here anymore. Could it be that person's device? Because I can see it very well. Okay. I, I can't I even see it from Mad my end. Madam Registrar has control. So maybe um, IT should give... Registrar, uh, can you help us out, please? Sir, the, the output is like this. Okay. Okay, sir. Um, I will just say, uh, I'll, I'll the follow, follow as, you, as you go on, please. I just need a few minutes because I can't even... I can't, from my end, I can't flip the screen. So I need to be able uh -huh. to flip the screen as well. I was going to say okay, that... We'll take over from there. We'll take okay. It's better at my end. So that is what a uh, corporate governance framework is about. So for the purpose of our, of our learning today, we shall be considering the framework of an enterprise in the context of companies. Enterprise controller in this context are the directors of the company. We shall be considering the key structures that forms the framework of corporate governance in companies. So you want to ask ourselves, what are the key structures that that uh, forms corporate governance in companies. Let's even start with the uh, agency theory in management. You know, agency theory is focused on how organizations are run. You know, uh, there are two uh, sections when we talk about running an organization, ownership and management. Ownership borders on the owners of the business. And when we look at the context of a company, ownership the ownership of the business is the shareholders of the business. Why management are the managers of the business. So the owners of the business themselves cannot be involved on a daily basis to run the business. They may not even have the expertise to be able to run the business. So people who are trained, people who are professionals in that regard are the ones who sit in and run the business on a daily basis. So what agency theory seeks to solve is uh, the problem of um, agency. You know, the truth is that when you put people in an organization to run a business, uh, going by human nature, 
the likelihood is that they will seek their own self-satisfaction as opposed to the, the benefit of the owners of the business. So this is where corporate governance comes in. Corporate governance come in uh, to put in place structures that would actually ensure and assure the owners of the business that the business is well run and to the very benefit of the organization. And in the process of our session today, you will see I will just be talking mostly about doing things uh, in the interest of the organization. And then when the things are done in the interest of the organization, effectively, it gets to the interest of all the stakeholders of that business. Even the managers of the business are stakeholders. Local community of the business is also a stakeholder. Uh, staff of the organization are also stakeholders as much as uh, the shareholders of the business. So now let's look at governance and, and versus management. Uh, when we talk governance, like we said at the beginning, that is about uh, how organizations are being run, how organizations are being administered. Now, when we talk about management, management are the managers, the people who sit in on a daily basis to run the business. So the structure of every business uh, in Nigeria today is such that you have a board. Uh, the board of directors don't get involved on a daily basis on how the business is run. So the function of the board is to govern the organization. So they provide strategic direction and leadership for the organization. While on the other hand, Management is involved in the daily running of the organization. So the management is actually composed of managers of the business who provide their, uh, their, their, their technical know-how, their experience, their professional services to the organization on a daily basis. So that's the pure distinction between governance and management. So gov corporate governance, uh, Gov uh, corporate boards are seen to play a critical role by offering direction and guidance to any corporate entity, just as the ownership structure has been identified as playing an important role in the governance of entities. Uh, powers of the board, yes. So for the board as the governor, uh, in the governance structure of the organization, the board is at the top. So there are certain powers that are reserved for the board, and we'll be looking at it when we talk about a, 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 a corporate governance structure. Delegation of authorities to the management. Yes, in as much as the board is the um, top in terms of power in the organization, they cannot get involved on a daily basis. So there are certain authorities they also have to delegate to management. So the board of directors retains certain matters for its decision making. So in delegating authority to the management, uh, they, they also have to be careful to ensure that they are not abdicating such authorities. So there are certain powers that have to be reserved for the board. I mean, when we look at this, we we'll realize certain cases only the board can give, the board can give some kind of approval. Uh, and in the governance scheme, in the framework of governance, even the board being at the top does not necessarily mean the one that will do all the strategic direction. For instance, the board also has various committees that support the board in the process of decision making. So these committees are like uh, the engine room. When we look at committee structure, we'll also talk about uh, those. So next slide, please. So next slide is about uh, types of board structure. Uh, board structure, we have two major types in, in terms of governance, which I will basically explain. But uh, it is only one that is adopted uh, in Nigeria, mostly adopted in Nigerian organization. First is unitary board, which is a one-tier board. That's what we are familiar with in most uh, organizations in Nigeria. This is where you have a separate management, which has nothing to do with the board. Then you have the unitary board, where the board of directors are the highest decision-making authority in the organization. The board of directors is led by the chairman of the, of the company. And the management of the company is equally led by the managing director. So, but the basic factor we need to realize here is that the governance structure is such that there is dual authority. One is the chairman, who is the leadership of the board, while the second is the managing director, who is the leadership of the management. And then the managing director serves in two capacities, as a manager of the business and also as a director in the organization. Now, the second uh, kind of uh, uh, board is the dual board 
system, which is TWA, uh, TWA, tier two board system. On that tier two board system, we have a um, supervisory board, and then we also have management board. You know, this is common in uh, European countries. This, they adopt that system in uh, Germany and some other European countries. But this is not the system we adopt in Nigeria. So I, I'm not going to dwell so much on that. Um, can we move to the next slide? So when we talk board composition, board composition, next slide, please. Blood composition refers to the configuration of the members of the board and their constituent committees. The number of directors is relevant, is a relevant feature that can have much to do with board mentoring and control system. <clears throat> there is no straight jacket about how many members should, is best for an organization. Uh, in certain regulated industries, they can give you a range and say, it must not exist certain number or it should not fall below a certain number. But what is key is, is that you look at the portfolio of your business, the size of your organization. Because when we talk governance, let us also remember there is a cost to governance. So if you have a small business and you have a large board, think about the cost. And that would also have a negative impact on the profitability of that organization. So this is why it is important that there is no straight jacket way of, except for some regulated industry where they give you specific number that you cannot exceed or fall below. But what is key as an organization is for you to look at the size of your organization, the portfolio of your business, even the industry where you fall into and decide what number do you want to keep? You know, what number do you consider as average or you consider as reasonable as a number for, for your board in terms of a board structure? Now, talking about a board composition, let, let me quickly take us through the types of director we, we, we have. Broadly, we have two types of director, the executive directors and the, the non-executive directors. Uh, even the non-executive directors will then have other species of directors when you talk about independent uh, directors. So let's focus for now on executive director. Who are the executive directors? You remember when I talked about management, the executive director are part of the management team. The executive uh, directors as an executive management uh, is led by the managing director of the organization. They act in dual capacity as managers of the business and also as directors. So they are sometimes described as functional directors. That is why you, you find in organizations uh, designations like a, a director of finance, uh, director, uh, you can even have director legal and corporate services. They have different kinds of directors. They are functional directors. They are, they, 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 their directorship relates with the kind of function they serve in the organization. But the basic thing is that these executive directors are managers in that business. They are involved in day to day running of the organization. So they are usually sectional head or divisional head. And when we talk about non-executive directors, the basic distinguishing factor is that the non-executive directors, as uh, described, are not involved in daily running of the organization. You know, however, however, if you are a non-executive director, if you have in the process of decision making, if you have reasons to request for opinion or reasons to require that you want to see certain aspect of the operation of the business. You, you have the right to, to do so. And even where you request for opinion or consultancy, uh, the, the, the organization has the obligation to bear the cost of uh, that opinion or consultancy if you are seeking it from a third party. So those are the broad uh, uh, species of directors we have, executive director and non-executive directors. And I'm sure that some of us can immediately relate with uh, uh, this. So let's look at a board leadership. At the top of the board is the chairman of the board. Who is the chairman? The chairman is the leadership of the board. The chairman provides enterprise leadership with the support of uh, other members of the board, broken down into various uh, committees of the board. So when we talk board structure, let's bear in mind that the chairman is the leadership of the board. You see some organization where you have 
vice chairman, not very common, but it's nice to also talk about it. Uh, some organization will even tell you executive vice chairman, you know. So some of these are uh, some, some of the ways people try to circumvent the uh, issue of uh, compliance. But the key thing we need to bear, based on the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance uh, uh, from, um, established in 2018, uh, we only have chairman who is the leadership of the board, and the chairman cannot be an executive chairman. There has to be separation of power between board leadership and management leadership. And that is why you have chairman as board leadership and managing director as the management leadership. So when we talk about non-executive director, as I had explained previously, there is another species of non-executive director, which is independent directors. Who are independent directors? These are direct, they are non-executive first. They are non-executive first. But uh, in recent times, uh, it has been encouraged even in the new Kama. Uh, that Kama is uh, the Company of Allied Matters Act uh, 2019, but it's often re referred to as Company of Allied Matters Act 2020. So there is a place for independent directors. These are directors who bring their knowledge to bear on the board uh, independently. Independently in the sense that they don't have significant ownership in that business. They don't have significant ownership. They don't have the usually, they are not expected to have relationship with uh, uh, the organization. And that is what makes them independent. Uh, if we look at uh, the provision of uh, principle seven of uh, the new Nigerian corporate Co governance uh, code, uh, it makes provision for what qualifies you to be uh, an independent director. We are still going to go through that in the course of this uh, uh, session. So next among the, the keyboard uh, uh, in the board structure is the company secretary. The company secretary is a focal point. The office is a focal point because uh, as much as the chairman and leadership of the organization is important, the company secretary is also very important. In fact, he's a principal player on the board of organization because the company secretary is, the, is a strategist. The company secretary uh, of old, people used to think company secretary were people who were just uh, uh, copy typists or people who just sit. In fact, I hear comments like, uh, you are only to be seen and not to be heard. Not company secretary of these days. If you look at the provision of various corporate governance uh, codes, even outside Nigeria, company secretary is supposed to be an advisor to the board. When you see the board is going wrong on issue, you advise the board. Uh, company secretary is supposed to be custodian of uh, so many things, compliance related issues, legal related issues. In fact, in certain instances, company secretary could even uh, advise on uh, financial related issues. And in certain instances, com some company secretary are actually financial controller because they have financial background. Uh, and if you look at the company allowed matter in Nigeria, a chartered accountant. Yeah, Are we together, please? I'm hearing some noise in the background. So, a company secretary could also be a chartered accountant. It is permitted under Nigerian uh, Corporate Governance uh, uh, Companies Act. So let us look at an uh, independent director. Can we move to the next slide, please? So, like I said earlier, in, an independent director is a non executive director. An independent director is defined as a director who has no affiliation with the firm except for his directorship, Clifford and Evans, 1997. So, like I said, principle seven of the NCCG code provides that INET, that is independent non executive directors, being a high degree, that they bring a high degree of objectivity to the board for sustaining stakeholder trust and confidence you know so when when it is found that you are objective in your decision making or contributions you are making to the board it helps to sustain stakeholders it gives stakeholders assurance so it sustains their trust and confidence in whatever contribution or decision making you are involved in so what qualifies you as an independent director 
I'm just going to be talking about a few of them, uh, but I will refer us to principle seven of Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance, where you have a non-exhaustive list. Please, can we go to the next slide? So please, let's make our time to, to, to review this and see all the... Uh, So the court described an idea as a non-executive director who is not a representative of shareholder that has ability to control or significantly influence management. You know, so what the code means in that regard is that anybody who is qualified to be who would be qualified to be an internal non-executive director should not be representing the interest of any shareholder who would have significant holding in the company, such that on the basis of his significant holding, when it comes to issue of voting, the person might be influencing the direction of the decision making in the organization. So uh, the, the INA does not, should not possess a shareholding in excess of 0.01%. So when you look at the shareholding of your organization, the INA should not have more than 0.01% of the paid up capital of the company. So if you look at the paid off capital of the organization and then you calculate what 0.01% will give you, then anybody who has beyond that definitely cannot become uh, an independent non-executive director. Nothing precludes the person from being a non-executive director, but the person cannot be, be independent in that regard. So an independent non-executive director does not handle consultancy for the company other than being a director. So what that basically means is that the independent non executive director cannot do any other job for the company apart from being a, a director of the company. So perhaps maybe somebody is thinking, what of uh, when the person makes disclosure and prove that uh, uh, there is no conflict of interest? Yes, with other category of directors, that could work based on the policies and um, of the organization. But when it comes to independent director, the person has to be truly independent in the real sense of it. So let's bear in mind that an independent director cannot be found to be doing any other job apart from being the director for the company. So you can't be a chartered accountant providing uh, consultancy services and then uh, would want to be appointed as an independent director of the organization. It, it will be ultra-biased, you know, like we see in the legal parlance. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just a continuation of uh, what qualifies you as an independent director. So the person who is an independent director should not be a substantial shareholder, should not be a representative of a shareholder that has the ability to control or significantly influence management. I think that's the repetition. And the person must not have been employed by the company or the group of which is currently forms part or served in any executive capacity in the company or group for the preceding three financial years. So what that means is that uh, within the last three years, such person should not have any form of relationship with the organization. So if you retired from uh, UBA bank, for instance, uh, you cannot be appointed as independent director, except that, except if you have served a, a cool off period. I will have to have a look at that very well. Except if you have had a full off period of uh, three years, otherwise you will not be qualified to be appointed. So now let's look at uh, in this in the framework. Let's look at the company secretary. The company secretary serves a pivotal role in the scheme of things uh, in the governance framework in every organization. Like I said earlier, the company secretary is a strategist. And as a strategist, is a strategic communicator. You know, so how your company secretary relates with the public has an impact on your organization. Think about it. When we look at, we, 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 we were discussing risk the other time, and I had the, the speaker talk about reputational risk. If your company secretary does not guard how he passes information to the public, it might, uh, it might, potential reputational risk 
for the organization. Even in regulated industries, where you relate with uh, regulators like uh, NSC, uh, that's Nigerian Stock Exchange, or Security and Exchange Commission, or even Central Bank of Nigeria, how the company secretary relates information to the regulators would have an impact on the outcome of the effect of that uh, communication. So it is important that every company secretary must acquire strategic communication skills, know when to talk, know how to talk, know when to the importance of every information, and know how and when to disseminate information to the benefit of the organization. So a company secretary acts as watchdog in every organization. So company secretary is in charge of um, is a custody of all rules, regulations, and laws binding every business the organizations get involved in. So it is important for the company secretary to be on his toes at all times to ensure that uh, the company is in compliance. You know, the company secretary is watching every possible area where there could be risk. And uh, this is where you talk about operational risk, you know, to ensure that uh, there is no, uh, no risk factor is affecting or impacting the organization uh, negatively. The company secretary is equally a scribe. Who is a scribe? The company secretary keeps charge of records of the company's documentation. The company secretary, when you are at board meetings, the company take minutes of the meetings. Uh, it is important for us to have that understanding. And that's why you find these days, when company secretary goes for meetings, some of them will go with minute recorder, who are usually like an assistant to them, who will help them put minutes to, together. This is because company secretary is also an actor in the scheme of things in the boardroom. Company secretary is equally making constructive contribution, you know. And like Yoruba people will say, in your call, only you cannot do all things at the same time. So it's important for company secretaries of today to bear in mind that in addition to technological tools, they also need people to support them in achieving their goals as a the, as, a, as a strategist in every organization. So company secretary is, in, is a custodian of the company's uh, assets. And when I say company assets, even the shareholding, uh, when you have a large portfolio of shareholders, the company secretary will deal with the registrars who are in charge of uh, the portfolio. So the first point of call in the organization with the external is usually the company secretary. The company secretary takes custody of all the constitutional documents of the organization. Your company incorporation documents, memorandum and articles of association of the company, policies of the company, especially where it relates to the board, the company secretary usually takes custody of this. Company secretary equally acts as liaison officer, you know, between the company and government agencies, between the company and regulators, and even between the company and other stakeholder groups relating with the company. So company secretary is the liaison officer. Uh, company secretary is also an advisor to the board and even to the company. So where, that's where, when you hold board meetings, the opinion of the company secretary is also always very key, you know, in decision making. Because the company secretary is vast in law, is vast in financial matters, it vast in corporate affairs, current development relating to your industry, the company secretary is able to advise on them. So this company secretary is a star player in the boardroom. So company secretary in some organization also act as regulatory uh, compliance officer. Some other big organization will appoint separate regulatory compliance officer. But again, company secretary is also a regulatory compliance officer. So company secretary keep records for the board. Company secretary can also be regarded as an, a corporate events manager. Events like uh, organizing your annual general meeting, organizing your extraordinary general meeting, and several other corporate events. Company secretary are usually the anchor of such an uh, event. Uh, company secretary also relates with uh, different categories and various levels of uh, investors. So you can also regard company secretary as investor relations manager. Company secretary are corporate services provider, you know. So they support uh, various level of corporate services in the organization. 
And that is why you see, in fact, in recent times, a lot of banks appoint, in addition to the role of company secretary, they appoint their company secretary as their group level uh, corporate services manager. And company secretary can also be regarded as external relations officer. External relations officer in the sense that the company secretary is like the face of the organization. So whenever there is need to relate with the public, oftentimes you see company secretary being part of a, a, anything relating to relating with the public. So you see now that uh, the role of the company secretary is, is, is very major in the scheme of things in the boardroom. So company secretary as a boardroom practitioner is a business strategist. We have gone beyond the era of considering company secretary as uh, just a clerk or administrator. So now let's look, go to effective board system. How do we achieve, oh, sorry, uh, attributes of company secretary. Let me just quickly take, go over this. So for you to be able to do all the jobs that we had described in our previous slides, what are the attributes you require? Number one, you must be a knowledgeable person. And being knowledgeable is not just enough. You must be given to continuous learning. As company secretary, you must uh, be familiar with your business environment. You must be familiar with all the rules and guidelines relating to your business. You must always develop yourself continuously to keep up with current development because you are in a position to advise the board and the organization at large. You must be a professional. Even before you become company secretary, you are, you are, you are trained to be a professional. Uh, take necessary professional certification, like uh, becoming a chartered secretary, chartered accountant, or chartered administrator. So this qualifies you well enough as a company secretary. The, a company secretary should also be emotionally intelligent. You must understand, study and understand your board, study and understand your management, and even the business environment. In fact, study and understand your regulators, how they react or respond to issues, how you relate with them, get involved, engage them, because there will be times that you will need them in order for you not to run a task where you need their opinion or advice, then you have to continuously engage with them. Engage continuously also with your stakeholders. You know, who are your stakeholders? Uh, your business environment, your local community, government, your staff, um, the owners of the business, and other people who have things to do with the business. Those are the stakeholders of your business. At different level, as a company secretary, you must be prepared to engage with them. You must be prepared to understand what they do and uh, have sound judgment on issue. You must have planning skills. You must also have high level of integrity and independence. When decisions are being made on the board, you must give that assurance that you are independent, you have independent and objective opinion on issues. Don't regard yourself as a staff. And for that reason, when issues relating to staff remuneration are being discussed, you then hold back information that will help management take appropriate decision. So as a company secretary, you must have independent mind at all times. You must have the capacity to be able to deal with issues objectively uh, with good uh, sense of judgment. Thank you. So now, please, like I said, if you have questions along the way or you want to make contribution or comment, please feel free to do so. I'm also open to learning from, uh, from us as well. So effective committee system. Good practice prescribes that independent directors should constitute the majority of the most important committees to ensure that executive management does not have undue influence over their handling of matters, which require decision making at the board level. Also, best practice requires that the board chairperson does not chair any of the committees. Most public companies maintain the following committees. Can we quickly run through the committees, please? So, there is no high trade jacket rule about the committees. There are various committees, but I selected these four committees because these are the ones very germane that a lot of public organizations usually adopt. But again, that could be cross-sectionalization uh, of the uh, activities of the committee. For instance, I see a situation where because of the cost of governance, you can have audit 
and the risk management committee merge together. You can have governance and nominations committee merge together. Yeah, I've seen various other committees. In fact, in certain instances, you see finance and general purposes committee, which is very common. And what organizations do is that if they don't want to honestly enlarge the size of the committees, they could have like two or three committees and then have general purposes committee merge with one of them. And what that does is that any other activity of the board that doesn't fall under the main committees will then fit into the general purposes committee. So the most common committee in that regard is usually finance and general purposes committee. So audit committee first. So what is the role of audit committee? Audit committee provides assurance on the internal audit process of the organization. This committee relates with the external auditors. So everything relating to control and compliance is being handled by the audit committee. Sorry, we are still on the committee structure. Please go back to the committee structure. So the next committee I would like to address is remuneration committee. This committee is actually in charge of everything relating to remuneration, whether staff remuneration or director remuneration. So these are the, uh, this is the committee that, is, that makes decisions in that regard. And this committee is usually shared by a non-executive director. In fact, it is advisable that none of the committees should be shared by the chairman of the board. And the, for the remuneration committee, it is purely composed of non-executive directors because uh, executive directors who are, are staff of the organization or managers of the business are not usually part of remuneration committee. Then we also have next to that nominations and governance committee. Uh, this committee is in charge of uh, nominations to the board or appointment of key uh, management staff in the organization. The committee is also in charge of uh, the governance process of the organization. All the policies uh, developed for the running of the organization is usually the responsibilities of uh, this committee. So where other committees have input, the committee will also, the governance co committee will always have uh, oversight on whatever uh, other committees are doing regarding uh, policies, policy development. So nominations and governance committee sees to this. Then you have a risk uh, management committee. And like I said, based on the issue of course, sometimes you have a situation where audit and risk management committee are matched together. So this is the committee that is in charge of everything relating to enterprise risk management in the organization. Uh, the management, various management committees submit all their risk reports to this committee and this committee gives a uh, oversight over all enterprise risk related matters uh, in the organization. Can we now go to uh, regulatory compliance and uh, enforcement? Excuse me, please. So what is regulatory compliance? I want to, as much as possible, make this class uh, interactive. Can somebody help us to define what regulatory compliance is or explain in your own understanding? Do we have somebody? Is the moderator there? Sorry, Dr. Hassan. I hope Hassan. I'm not talking to myself. I'm not hearing anybody say anything. Dr. Hassan, this is Shufola. This is Shufola. Oh, sure. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, sir. I put some questions in the chat room. I, I don't okay. know if you can please address them. I didn't want to disturb you when you were. No, please. It's not any disturbance. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, it makes the class uh, very interesting and interactive. So I'm seeing your question. You say, what is the relationship between corporate governance framework and corporate governance maturity model? What is the corporate governance maturity model? And is there a universally accepted model? 
Okay. On independent directors, Kama's definition of independent director is, in my opinion, very ambig ambiguous. The Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance is clear and more in tune with modern practice. Please, how do we proceed on the matter bearing in mind that Kama is an act? Okay, so let me start with the, the second question, which is actually not a question. You've actually answered it. You said uh, on independent directors, Kama's definition of independent director is, in my opinion, yes. I mean, you express your opinion. Uh, truth be told, I share your opinion. Uh, there are a lot of debates going on about the new Kama. Uh, for almost 40 years, we've stuck to only one law that had not been reviewed. So it's is quite welcoming and interesting that uh, the law is being reviewed and a good number of changes made in it is very positive. On, uh, at the same time, I'm also aware that there has been a lot of debate about uh, convoluted issues arising from certain changes in karma. And uh, the one that baffles me the most is where within the same uh, business environment, we have different uh, laws and regulations that are conflicting in certain instances. So, and this is op the opinion you have expressed and I share the same view, but then, I mean, every law for me is a process. There is also a process of reviewing the law. I, I know that uh, quite a number of advocacy has been going on, led by Institute of Charter Secretaries on uh, requests to make some changes in the regulations and even in karma itself. So it, it's an ongoing process. And like we always say in, the, in corporate governance, corporate governance is, is not an end, it's a means. So it, it, it's a, we continuously learn and we continuously improve and find ways of making things better. So even the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance that you applauded, uh, we've had various uh, Code of Corporate Governance even before then. So we, we graduated to this level and I know that it can always get better. Then about the model of corporate governance, if you recall, I talked about a dual system of board and the and the unitary system. There are various models, but the model we adopt in Nigeria uh, and that is most common. And I'm not saying that uh, other models don't operate at all in Nigeria, especially where you have uh, organizations who have their parent company abroad. Take for instance, if you have a company that operates an office in Nigeria and they have uh, their parent company in Germany. Clearly, their corporate governance model will be different from what we use in Nigeria, even though they have uh, a, a parent, a, sorry, a subsidiary company in Nigeria. So that is why I, I'm always very careful to say mostly used. So mostly used in Nigeria is the uh, unitary board system. And that is what our corporate governance is model on. And that is why you have our corporate governance code distinguishing between uh, creating dual creating dual power in the running of, of an organization. You have the chairman who is the leadership of the board and managing director. So those offices must always be separated. Any Nigerian registered or Nigerian run company who is running any model outside of that is actually uh, not in compliance with uh, the provisions of the corporate governance. So uh, when such things happen, there are probably organizations who are not subject to the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance. Uh, let me also just quickly say here that uh, Nigeria Code of Corporate Governance applies mostly to public quoted companies. Some other private companies who are regulated, you know, are also subject to the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance. So you might have a small company who is not a regulated company, who is, that is a private company, adopting other models beyond what is recognized by the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance. But just bear in mind that uh, public quoted companies in Nigeria and the private companies who are regulated in Nigeria are also subject to the uh, adoption of the provisions of the uh, Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance. I'm also seeing another question here. It seems all participants have been muted. Oh, so can um, the moderator do something about that? 
Somebody just said that all participants have been muted, and that's probably why they are not contributing. Some sure. participants were distracting with audios, reason why everyone is muted. However, it has been okay, good. Thank you. So, is there any other question, please? Okay, um, mine is not a question, it's just a request. Uh, is it possible we have um, the responsibilities the also um, in, incorporated into this presentation for each of the, uh, what's it called? For each of the, uh, make the functions defined within the board structure. Vis a vis independent director. I said, is it possible to, could you incorporate uh, the responsibilities of each of the functions that makes up the board structure in the slide, sir? Okay, uh, you know, the, the, it's fine. We will be able to do that, but because it, it's uh, they are in slide forms, so we can't overload the slides. So that's why I I prefer using the key points and explaining it. But again, we will we'll see to it and make sure that uh, you get the responsibilities. Thank you. So if there is no more question, can we make progress as we move to the other part of the paper, which is on regulatory compliance and enforcement? So I, I was asking a volunteer to explain what regulatory compliance means. But in the absence of any volunteer, I guess I'll just proceed. So regulatory compliance is a process by which organizations adhere to the rules, laws, regulations, and guidelines binding their operations. You know, for every business, your business environment must have some rules, regulations, and guidelines binding your organization. And what actually helps you to ensure you continue to fall in line, you don't fall out of line, is to put in place a process of compliance. And that, that is what is often referred to as regulatory compliance. I will use an example of a highly regulated industry like commercial banks in Nigeria. The primary regulators for commercial bank in Nigeria is the Central Bank of Nigeria. So central bank will usually issue policies and guidelines, you know, in the process of running a bank, you must always comply with all the policies and guidelines. So as a bank in Nigeria, for instance, as a company first, as a bank, you are a company. And as a company, you are guided by the laws of uh, KAMA, which is the Company Allied Matters Act. Again, if you are a public quoted bank, you are also guided by the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance. Again, since you are a bank licensed by the Central Bank of Nigeria, you are also guided by the regulations of Central Bank. So I can go on and on and on about various regulations applicable to your industry. So as a, as a business leader, whether a bank or whatever kind of business you find yourself in, it is important for you to ensure that uh, you understand the regulatory environment. And when I say regulatory environment, what are the laws, rules, guidelines, codes binding the business, your business operation? And when you have found out, when you have found this out, it is important for you to also put in place policy on how you want to be complying and ensure continuous compliance. I mean, for big organizations, you have compliance department. For me, if you ask me, I would say each and every one of us in any organization is a compliance officer. Because the ideal thing is for you to also always ensure that you do things right. And when we talk about doing things right, it's about following the rules and regulations laid down in running that business. And in simple terms, that's what regulatory compliance is all about. So these guidelines may vary from industry to industry. It is key for organizations to identify such guidelines to monitor and control their operations. So how do we then proceed after identifying the guidelines for you to monitor and control your operation in order to give assurance to your regulators and other stakeholder group in your organization? Next slide, please.
So that then takes us to managing. Okay, let me just quickly take regulatory compliance as a strategic management tool. Yes. You know, uh, in 21st century business management, we have to be strategic in everything we do. Even in branding, things as simple as branding. If you are not strategic, you will realize that uh, you will not become you will not be competitive, especially when you find yourself in a very competitive environment. So, regulatory compliance can serve as a strategic management tool. It can provide a source of competitive advantage. You know, if you have an organization that complies, and then you make strategic disclosure or noise about how you have been compliant, it will attract businesses to you. Let me give you an instance from the insurance industry. It is a compliance issue for every insurance underwriter to ensure payment of claims as and when due. So you find in fact, I think uh, NICOM, uh, that is the commission that regulates the insurance industry. NICOM requires insurance company to make publication about a claim settlement. And when you comply with this regulation and you make publication about your claim settlement, prompt claim settlement, look at the effect it's going to have on your clientele. If I open the new pages of paper and I see that a particular insurance industry has a record of prompt settlement of claims, if I want to in short, I will think about that insurance company first. And that's what I meant by giving you competitive advantage. So if you are a compliant organization, you have a competitive edge above your competitors because they see the public sees you as an organization that is compliant. If, for instance, I want to, I'm a huge investor and I need to invest in a bank, the first thing I'll do is to open the annual, uh, annual financial statements of the organization. So the story, the, 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 the content of the financial statement is going to tell me a story about the organization. And it's going to inform my decision making about that, my investment decision making about that organization. So that is one huge advantage that uh, regulatory compliance uh, offers. Regulatory compliance can also create value for the enterprise in terms of good corporate and compliance culture. When you are an organization that is seen to be compliant at all times, you know, it improves your view. It improves the perception of the public about your corporate culture, you know. And it makes even your internal staff feel good about themselves. I don't want to advertise for any bank, but there are some banks they mentioned today, and the people will tell you, oh, it's a fantastic bank. If you mention a bank today, uh, there is hardly anybody, you know, within our environment who don't have account with the bank. But there are certain, in fact, interestingly, there was a time I needed to open accounts with a particular bank. I don't intend to run any bank that I'm not going to mention the name of the bank. And then, because we wanted to do some consultancy services for them, they insisted that we must open an account with them. So you know this process where you are now required to get a reference from two customers of the bank. For like one month, I was going around looking for people who had accounts in this bank. But everybody, in fact, people were making fun of me. Now, what are you still doing with that bank? Nobody has any accounts with them. So, I mean, this could be the effect of uh, issues relating to regulatory compliance. So if you have a bank that is that does not have the culture of a uh, co good corporate culture, it will impact their reputation. And their reputation will definitely in turn impact their, their clientele, their businesses. So regulatory compliance also helps in managing reputational risks for the enterprise. I mean, I actually explained that, you know, the reputation of your enterprise goes along, it is your brand, it is your signature as an ent enterprise. So it goes along the get up of your enterprise. So if your enterprise has a bad a regulatory compliance track record, it will have negative impact of, on your reputation as, as an organization. So uh, as a strategic tool, you use regulatory compliance to improve your 
to manage your reputational risk as an organization. Regulatory compliance also helps in continuous process improvement for the enterprise. You know, if you are, if you, and that's why you have uh, departments like control and compliance in place in organization, because the essence of control and compliance is to even work with them to check your operational risk in your business, to go around and ensure that all your staff, various departments in the organization are complying with the laid down regulations. And in the process, you are sharpening the skills of your staff on how to run and manage a business. You know, so it is not all the time that you have to sit in a former classroom to learn. So when you put in place appropriate processes and procedure, and you appoint somebody who is like a police officer within the organizations to monitor and control and ensure compliance, in the process, you are also improving the skills of your workforce and that you are preparing them for higher challenges and effectively improving the profitability of the organization. Because when your business is well run, then you can be sure of the success of the business. So regulatory compliance also helps to, uh, to enhance uh, internal control systems for achieving organizational goals. I mean, the goal of every business is uh, to be profitable. The goal of every business is to be successful. And this is where I distinguish between profit and uh, success. Uh, we, we've had banks in before the major bank manager in 2004. We've had banks who made a lot of profit, but are not nowhere to be found today. So, but then a bank like, uh, permit me to mention First Bank, because First Bank is over a century old. So a bank like First Bank, uh, has gone through thick and thin over the years and they still remain. So that is how I define success because they, they've laid down legacies, generations to generations of uh, people have gone through First Bank. And then you will say such a bank is a successful bank. I, I apologize for mentioning the name of that bank, but it's because it's a 100, 100 years is quite significant and it cannot be ignored. So I'm not getting paid by First Bank to do that. So let's look at uh, managing compliance. Next slide, please. Okay. So in the process of managing compliance, there are key things that as a compliance officer in the organization, you have to be aware of. One, create awareness. How do we create awareness? By way of information. You, cannot, you can never over inform your staff or your workforce about what they need to know. You know, do capacity development, organize trainings, let them be aware of uh, all the rules, guidelines relating to that industry. You know, I remember when I, I, I was a zonal manager in the bank, we had a, a group of staff that we call, uh, we call them trainees. So they were marketing products. And in the morning when I come to work, I'll just ask them as a customer of the bank, this is, the, this is what I want, advise me which product, tell me the features of this particular product, you know. So it's, it's, it's a way of creating awareness and ensuring that your workforce are aware of what they are selling. So as it is important for you to let your workforce be aware of what they are selling, it's equally important for you to ensure that your workforce is aware of the rules and regulation binding their business operation. And that helps them to be informed about uh, the issue of uh, regulatory compliance. As an organization, we should always aspire to achieve conformance at all times. You know, we should avoid the um, constructive compliance. We'll get to a place, a, a, another slide where I will explain constructive compliance. So we should aspire to achieve conformance. Ensure at all time we conform with all the guidelines binding our businesses. And how do we achieve that? We should set goals, you know, set goals and decide that there is zero tolerance for non-conformance. 
And when we do this, it definitely improves a lot of the organization. And then as an organization, we should take responsibilities for our actions. And what I mean by that is that when we know what we are meant to do based on the industry related regulations, we should set a timeline, set tables. Take for instance, if you are required to render return to Nigeria Stock Exchange within 30 days of uh, having your annual general meeting, set a timeline for yourself that you want to achieve it within 15 days. And that would help you to always ensure that you fall within line and you don't cross the line that would then attract um, fines or any form of sanction against uh, the organization. Next slide, please. So this slide is uh, talking about the effective management of regulatory compliance. As an organization, how do we effectively manage compliance? Moderator, I hope I'm still within time. I didn't actually check time when we started. So number one is to designate a chief compliance officer. You know, where you cannot afford to designate one, depart one department to run this, you can combine the role with the role of company secretary or any other related officer within the organization. So this chief compliance officer will be the coordinator. Sorry, the person sir. will be the one sir, relating. Sorry, sorry, sorry to interject, sir. You have uh, 10 more minutes, sir. Oh, okay. So yes. the person will Thank be you. the one relating with the regulators of that industry to ensure that uh, all the necessary compliance issues are being well managed. Then you identify applicable regulations. Know your laws, know your rules, know your policies, know your guidelines and all necessary procedure. In fact, we usually advise that you develop a compliance grid. So if you find yourself in a particular industry and you have identified all the applicable regulations, annex them into a document and create a compliance grid. And technology has even come in to help us. We can put this on our phones. It will remind you, if you are meant to file something within 30 days, it will pop up two days to the due date. So as a compliance uh, manager, if you put all of this in place and use regulation to help your, uh, sorry, technology to, to do this, you can have a situation where all of these are set in a system that you will be prompted before due date. Regulate, regularly update personnel knowledge and capacity development. You can never, learning is continuous. No matter how old you are, you continue to learn. So even in this session that we are holding within the past uh, 40 to 50 minutes, I've picked one or two things to enhance my knowledge. So every organization should invest in capacity development, training, on-the-job training, continuous information to your staff, you know, and in certain instances, if necessary, do exchange program. Send your staff to other organizations to see how things are being run and then I, I always say copying is in it, itself is a strategy, it's not a crime. If you see something good that is being done in another organization, you can adopt or adapt it. So avoid constructive compliance. Constructive or compliance is a situation where I'll just give you a, an example in order not to waste our time. Where you embark on a particular business and you know your regulator does not approve of such, I'll give an example of, a, 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 of banks. In those days that banks were doing free, free, there's something they call free funding or skyrocketing foreign exchange in the market. So some banks were doing it to mop up profit. But when they do it, they know that the, the implication or the sanction for it is to collect 2 million naira. So when they look at the profit they will make from it, they will go ahead and do it and pay the 2 million naira. So that's a, a form of constructive compliance. But then what does that portend for that organization? Any organization doing that is not managing its reputational risk. Because remember that you have to report all your infractions in your financial statements, which is issued to the public, is a public document. So even though you are making profit, the moment I see that from time to time, you are always being uh, fined for one infraction or the other. Then I know this is not a very well-managed organization. This is not a corporate governance compliance organization. 
And that will affect my decision making in terms of investing in your organization. Then we also should avoid selective compliance. You see certain situations where some organizations, sometimes we propose to organizations to say, you are meant to be doing board evaluation of your organization. And they'll tell you how much the cost is high. They are not going to do it. You know, so those are way of doing a selective compliance. So you choose to, you choose part of the regulation you want to comply with, and then you ignore certain parts for one reason or the other. So we always advise that you avoid selective compliance. It, it, it doesn't do your organization well in any way. So we are going to be running fast now. So uh, moderator, please flip so that uh, we have just 10 minutes. Effect of poor regulatory compliance on organizations. It attracts fines and sanctions. It damages your re reputation as an organization. It reduces competitive advantage. It can also lead to withdrawal of your operating license where you are not a compliant uh, organization. Uh, what are the drawbacks to regulatory compliance? Yes, there are drawbacks, especially in a situation where an industry is overregulated. Example, banking industry in Nigeria. If at a point, you will find a situation where in the bank, there are conflicting regulations. SEC, that is the Security and Exchange Commission, will tell you to do this. And CBN is telling you to do something different. You know, I remember when we had that, that issue when I was in the bank, uh, it became an issue that uh, we had to form a, a pressure group to, to find a way to resolve. And we became very creative about it. I remember how it was solved then was that we should comply with the tougher regulation, you know, so that then puts you on uh, a good stand. So when there is a overregulation, what are the likely drawbacks? Um, fines and sanctions every now and then. Then reputational damage to the organization. You know, when your organization is a uh, happening too much on issue of regulation, it can create regulational dam uh, reputational damage. For instance, uh, when you are opening an account with a particular bank and you are asking for too much, the truth is that it, it can reduce your competitiveness. If you are insisting, get this, get that, bring your grandfather's birth certificate, and you see other banks that will just give you only one, one pager, fill this form online, and then we open your account and give you an account number immediately. While the other bank is telling you, they will give you one big booklet, fill the form, bring this, bring that, bring the other one, bring the other one, then it becomes frustrating. So you rather go to the bank that will make things happen for you and then make your business effective. So that is where we say that it reduces competitive advantage. And it can also lead to withdrawal. Of, oh, sorry. I'm looking at another slide. Please, can you go down, please? OK. So, so capital flight, it can create capital flight. In extreme cases, if your business environment is too tough and there, there is overregulated, there is too much compliance issue, you find some foreign investor deciding to leave Nigeria. These are part of the reasons. Then transaction cost, overregulation, if you look at the cost of uh, compliance, it becomes very tough for you. And this can actually stifle business operation. Then Another drawback is it's capable of reducing innovation, investment, and country competitiveness. You know, uh, it, it reduces the ability of organizations to be innovative about how they handle things. Let me give you an instance. I remember in those days when we were in the bank, that was a, one of the banks I, I worked with. That was a particular product we created because of the problem of regulation. Because they will tell you, CBA regulation will tell you, you cannot open an account except the organization is registered with CAC. You have to bring CAC document, bring this, bring that. And then we found that there are quite a number of unregistered associations. Take, for instance, your landlord and resident association. And they carry a lot of huge funds around. And that's just one instance. There are so many instances of uh, associations. So we then became creative that how can we help these organizations? So we now created a product called 
account opening for unregistered association. So what we then did was that we will select their executive who are the signatories to the account. So they are the face of that unregistered organization. So every regulatory requirement that we need to obtain, we will obtain from those individuals. So effectively, they then become the holders of the account, but the name of the account will remain the name of the association, even though unregistered. Bet it, we achieved a lot with that because a good number of banks were not innovative enough to be able to create that. So when we created it, we commanded huge crowd of such customers who belong to that category. So these are part of the drawbacks of uh, regulation because it reduces innovation. So when there is no overregulation, there is room for organizations to be able to be innovative in, and creative in how they manage their products and services. Then uh, overregulation also has potentials for reducing business competitiveness. This, this can be drawn from the very previous explanation. And then uh, we go to the last slide now. Uh, the last slide is just about uh, attributes. Okay. Before the last slide, we have one more, which is advice to policymakers on regulatory compliance. Uh, ultimately, what re regulators intend to achieve is to create value for the enterprise and the economy. So if you have that mindset of creating value for enterprise and the economy, then don't overregulate in such a way that you now then stifle the same enterprise and effectively the same economy. So regulation should, policymakers should be equitable in the process of uh, making regulations. They should look at the interests of all stakeholders and look at how it affects them as individuals and as organization. And this is why it is important for organizations, uh, representative like company secretary and compliance officer to always have opinion when regulations are being made. You will know that in certain instances, when regulators are coming up uh, with uh, regulations, they do exposure draft. So when they send this exposure draft to you, always make your comment, don't be lazy about it. Because Yoruba will say, oh, will think, Bobby. if you don't make comments about it, they will go ahead and make the regulation and it might negatively impact your business. But if you make your comments known and you express your views about issues, it can be discussed in the course of exposure draft and it can affect how that regulation is going to be determined eventually. And then we also advise that regulation should always be consistent and transparent in the process of uh, regulation. Not when CBN comes out today, they say something different. Tomorrow, they say something different and they keep changing goalposts. Then it becomes inconsistent. So regulators are advised to be consistent and transparent with the way they make uh, regulation. And in conclusion, I will just quickly look at the attributes of effective board. Attributes of effective board. An effective board must be a high performing board. What makes a board a high performing board? The leadership of the board must be in control. The chairman must be knowledgeable. He must be in control. He must not be influenced by any shareholder. He must be, his uh, reasoning or judgment on issues should be very objective. Uh, the board should also delegate authorities where necessary. Delegate authorities to the managing director and the, the executive management as a whole. Board must be always be in a position of trust with high integrity. Nothing should influence the judgment of the board. Uh, the board should not um, manage or, or give strategic direction in a way that uh, the interests of the organization will be jeopardized. Then from time to time, board should review. They have various uh, mechanisms for reviewing the performance of the board itself. And where necessary, if you need to juggle, remove one director from one committee to another committee because you have identified the strength of that director, then the board should do so. In any case, when you do your board appraisal, it will reveal all these gap areas. So it is the responsibility of the board to ensure that all these gap areas are well uh, filled to ensure that uh, everything works in the interest of the organization. 
Board leadership must be very open and transparent. Uh, not that you have a board meeting. Before board meeting, you've met with one caucus, you've decided what you want to say, you've acted it out, and then you just come to the board meeting and play a script. So board probity is also very important. So board leadership must be seen to be high performing, be in control, and uh, give uh, appropriate strategic uh, oversight and direction. Thank you. So at this point, I'll, I'll be stopping to request for questions and answers, and then we can uh, make progress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor, for that wonderful and insightful presentation. Very, very rich, very, very educative, and uh, highly informative. Thank you very much. We appreciate you for that. Our dear distinguished participants, you've heard our dear doctor make his presentation. So please, if you have uh, questions, observations, comments, please make them now so that we can have them. Any question? You can also channel your question to the chat box or by indication of raise of your hand. So please let's have them so that doctor can do justice to the questions. Thank you. So any question? Any question? Any question from any of our participants? I can't see anybody asking any question. Nothing in the chat box. No indication of raise of hand. Uh, well, so if there are no questions, no comments, then, okay, Mr. Shaw is acknowledging and thanking doctor for a very good delivery. Okay, thank you. It's appreciating doctor for a wonderful presentation. So that shows that he really, really got something from that presentation. Okay. All right. So if at this point there are no comments or questions, we would then want to once again thank our dear doctor. Okay, someone has a question, Ibrahim Idu. Are there other theories that define corporate governance? I can't, it's off again. Okay, are there other theories that define corporate governance framework? Okay, uh, well, there are various theories that uh, one can adopt for corporate governance favors. I can't readily recall, but uh, the one that I know about now, I can explain that, is what is called um, um, resource dependency theory. You know, what is resource dependency theory in corporate governance? Where, for instance, when you are setting up a board, uh, if you put all accountants on your board, you can imagine what the outcome of that will be or if you put all lawyers on your board. So resource dependency basically talks about how you depend on the resources that various board members are going to bring to the board. So that is why you have a mix of ideas and knowledge. So when nominations committee is considering constitution of the board, you look at uh, the background of the members being considered. So you ensure that uh, you have, um, even gender issue is also part of it. So you, you ensure that as much as you have accountants, you have lawyers, you have people who can bring to bear their knowledge in risk management. So you have a mix of knowledge and ideas. So basically what that theory is saying is that you depend on the resources that the directors are able to bring on board. So resource dependency theory, is another theory of uh, corporate governance. Another theory of corporate governance uh, is a uh, stakeholder theory. And basically what stakeholder theory says is, if you regard only shareholders as the owners of the business, 
The shareholders are not the ones running the business, even though they've invested in the business. So how do you then achieve success? So you are now then going to extend the interest to other stakeholder group, which will include, number one, staff and management of the organization. You need to put their interest in decision making. Number two, vendors to that organization. Because they are your suppliers, they are one way or the other, they hand income from you. You also hand services from them. So it's important to also consider them in decision making. Number three, you also look at a uh, government who earn taxes from the you know revenue from the taxes you pay. So that government is also a stakeholder in your business. Your local community, if you are in manufacturing, for instance, and the emission coming out of your manufacturing activity is having negative impact on the lives of, uh, of uh, your local community, the people within your local community, then it will create some reputational damage to that organization, which will negatively impact uh, the success of that organization. So stakeholder theory is also another very key theory in, in the scheme of uh, 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 things in corporate governance framework. So I think I've mentioned the three theories and for now. You can talk to me later if you want more, then I will let you know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your response to that question. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think we have any other Okay, someone is asking, how would you advise a small company to implement the code of corporate governance? Okay, I will assume that a small company is a private company. Uh, certain categories of private company are, are actually not um, subject to the Nigerian code of corporate governance. However, you know, there's something we advise when uh, we deal with uh, clients. Even though you are not subject to complying with the codes, but make it your own internal governance standard. Because if you are doing so, if other people are doing something and it's making them achieve success, then why do you want to ignore it? Even though the law or the code does not make it compulsory for you to comply, in your own little way, right? Comply and create your own internal governance process. And how do you do that? If you are a small company, you don't necessarily have to have all these key departments to be able to comply. You know, there are certain things you can even outsource. And good enough, there are a number of corporate uh, services consultants these days who offer bouquet of services. They do outsource uh, uh, human resourcing, outsource uh, accounting and all that. So if you run a five-man business where the, uh, the entirety of your staff is not more than 10, for instance, look at your business environment. What are the things you are supposed to be doing? Synchronize them into a document and be ticking them to ensure you are complying. Okay, are you supposed to file returns? Do the necessary things. Uh, are you supposed to pay tax? If you cannot have a tax department, outsource that service to a local uh, tax uh, consultant who will charge you something minimal to ensure you file your tax at all times. So you just create your own internal governance process and make sure you are fall, following, falling in line at all times. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor, for that response. I think we just another question. Yes, uh, that, maybe that will be the last. Uh, it says, what's the difference between corporate governance and code of corporate governance? The difference between corporate governance and the code of corporate governance. OK, you see, you cannot really separate the two. But I'll make an attempt to explain for clarity. Corporate governance is a concept is a concept, you know. Now the code, like we said earlier, when we talked about uh, regulatory compliance, so the codes are the guidelines, rules set for you to adopt so that you will know that you are doing good governance. You know, when you say something is good, that can be bad governance and that can be good governance. So corporate governance in itself is a concept on its own. So the code is what helps you to achieve 
that level, standard of good governance that will put your organization in the proper state. So that's the best attempt I can make to separate corporate governance and the code of corporate governance. Corporate governance is a concept, while the other one is a means for you to achieve that level of uh, good governance. But in the real sense, you can't really separate the two.